Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. I'm sorry, I did not get my bearings correctly. Okay, so this afternoon, let's talk briefly about Trump's victory in the recently held U.S. presidential elections and the impact for the Caribbean. Just my thoughts. I'm sharing some thoughts on his victory and what implications will this victory have for the Caribbean and Latin American region. Now, it's interesting to note that many Latinos in the United States voted for Trump. Many working class Latinos voted for Trump. And this was the people are calling them white supremacists because they sided with Trump, which is ridiculous, right? Because people at the end of the day, they will have to look at their pocketbooks and their ability to survive, their capacity to survive economically. And we know that the Democratic Party has aligned themselves closely towards the agenda of the elites and that they have not even questioned the concerns the legitimate concerns of working class people and the middle class also, because you must understand that what impacts the working class will eventually and is affecting the middle class. I think some people think because they have a nice job, a cozy job, that things are okay. They voted for the Democratic Party because they could not see that the Democratic Party is moving the country into a direction in which it would be taken over by all of these neoliberal authoritarians who believe that the economy of the United States and the country at large should be run by elite and elite interest only, and that the desires and the hopes of the people should not be taken into account, right? That is what essentially the Democratic Party is all about. Now, if you, if you disbelieve me, the conversation, which is a left-wing paper, by the way, opened up this morning a story that they are presenting Further U.S. election and, and analysis, Hispanics and young men swung big to Trump, right? So we have Hispanics and young men swung to Trump. So in spite of the cultural wars that the Democratic Party was waging, and they believed that young people, particularly young women, well, young women perhaps would have voted for Kamala. Um, I was supposed to have looked for the breakdown of the ethnic groups and whom they voted for. I do know that the majority of Black people, even though we were saying, you know, the Obamas were at Black people, Black men particularly, I do know that Black men did not vote overwhelmingly for Kamala Harris. But the 25%, I think Trump got 25% of the Black vote. That was a huge percentage that he had garnered in the 2016 elections, right? That should say a lot about the perception of the Democratic Party by Black people. Now, look at what the conversation is saying. Republican Donald Trump won the United States presidential election by 312 electoral votes to 226 for Democrat Kamala Harris. Now, let me just say here categorically, I knew that Donald Trump would have won the popular vote. And I think I said that in a previous video, that I knew that he was going to win the popular vote. I thought the Democrats, because they seem to have invested so much money, over a billion dollars in campaigning, that they would have found some way to rig the election. For those of you who do not know, the presidential elections in the United States is a rigged system, right? It is a rigged it's a rigged system. It's not a system that you think is run democratically and transparently. It's never been so. And in recent times, in more modern times, we have seen where the trend is even getting um, nastier, right, and uglier. Now, the question is that would Donald Trump have won the electoral college votes? And I was thinking that maybe that's what it would have been in like 2016 when Hillary won the popular votes and Donald Trump won the electoral college votes. Uh, because it seems to me that the elites, even though they propped her up, didn't want her to be a part of the, they didn't want her to be president. All right. It's obvious that the people, particularly in the Democratic circle, wanted Hillary in 2016 to have been president. But the among the elite circles, they would not like her. They would not want her. They did not want her, I should say to have been president. 
fast forward on to 2024, I thought the elites. But it, it depends on who we call the elites, because remember now that you have factions within the elites. So you have the what we call the more liberal faction, you have the more religious faction, you have the conservative faction, you have the moderately conserv conservative faction. This election was consequential in the sense that we could not determine who was who, because when you look at the fact that the, the, the likes of the Liz Cheney's and the Dick Cheney's and all of these people who joined up 200 of the most important elite groups of the representing the Republican Party joined up with the Democrats. It was sort of confusing in terms of who is who and what are their interests, what are their agendas. So that from that perspective, this election was very difficult to call because one would not have who is whose interest is being represented really at the end of the day, not the interest of the people, far from it. Now, in terms of, say, the interest of the people, let's go back to that. The elections, we must say, we have to give the U.S. political system, political, political machine, this time around, credit that it allowed the people's voice to have been heard. A lot of time, the people's voices are not heard. But in this election, in which Donald Trump won the election, the, the popular votes, the people spoke through the popular votes that they were not happy with the trajectory of the United States. They were not happy with the economics. They were not happy, were, were not happy with the in way in which the immigration situation is being handled by the Democrats. And there are ongoing issues too in terms of how the pandemic was handled and the mandatory vaccines and the fact that businesses were closed down because of these long, lengthy lockdowns in which Trump was not in favor of. Trump was not in favor of the lengthy lockdowns that the Democrats were in favor of. And that is how they sort of beat him in 2020, because people were facing it again. They were facing the economic strains that were the consequences of the lengthy lockdowns, in which thousands of businesses, middle to medium to small to medium sized businesses, were closed, were shut down, and will never be reopened. And it caused the deaths, it caused the, some people to have committed suicide, because they could not say how they would have been able to eke out a living. So people voted for the Democratic Party, thinking that they would have come, and that they would have carved out some manner of resuscitating, resurrecting the economic lifeblood of the American economy, but they did not. Instead, Joe Biden, you know, caused many people to have lost their jobs by the mandates, the vaccine mandates that he imposed. Then you have the war that he actually provoked against Russia um, in the Ukraine. And we also have the ongoing war now in the Gaza area. I mean, that was a death knell for the Democrats, the economy and the unending wars. And both are connected because if, if the citizens of the United States are seeing where the current administration, the incumbent government, is sending billions of dollars to the Ukraine and to Israel to wage war, to wage unnecessary war, because these wars could have been stopped. And by the way, I'm already seeing in the, in the news, I don't know if you're following that, that, you know, already Trump is saying to... Netanyahu that you have to now stop the war. We need the war and please end the war by the time I get to office. He's already sending that message to Netanyahu that this war, I am not going to tolerate it. I am not going to be having an ongoing war whilst I'm in office, while during my tenure in office. Trump is saying that already. He's using and he has, all, he has not yet gone to office. He has not yet uh, invested into that office, but he's able to use his authority as an ex-president and as the president-elect to tell Netanyahu that enough is enough. And already there is news that Putin is suggesting that he's willing to sit down and negotiate with Trump in terms of the conditions of stopping, of terminating 
the war in the Ukraine. Now, why couldn't the Democrats have done that? Because Netanyahu and, well, some people claim that Putin and Trump are friends. They're not friends. And Trump has said on many occasions that even he has, he has acknowledged, Trump has acknowledged that Putin is actually a snake, <laughs> right? And that you have to be careful in negotiation with him. So you, we know that on that basis, he's not friendly, he's not friendly, with, but you have to develop. Diplomacy is important if you want the end of wars. You cannot just use your military might. Might is not always right, especially if you have not yet, you know, negotiated the matter, the issue, the problem. And Trump, give him his credit, he knows how to negotiate. He's transactional. And you're wondering, with all these educated people in the Democratic Party, the, the ones who claim that they are, you know, graduates of Harvard University, of Princeton's and the Yale's, I mean, and they have not been able to negotiate with Putin, but the Democratic Party does not want to negotiate, right? The Pentagon, the people who work within the Pentagon, they want these ongoing wars. They want these unending wars because it's profitable for the military industrial complex. They sell more weapons. They, the contractors are garnering money and the list goes on. But at the end of the day, it is, while it, it is beneficial to some, a small segment, I should say, of the U.S. economy, the large majority of people are not benefiting from the large scale killing and murdering of people around the world. Just a select minority are benefiting from that sort of, you know, um, catastrophic, from these catastrophic wars. So make no bones about it. Let's now be clear on that, that the Democratic Party is a party that seems to have morphed into this warlike machine. And people saw that and people have been criticizing them about it, but people tend to look beyond what they're doing and think, oh, we believe in their rhetoric. Whatever they talk about, you know, we're all equal and this sexual revolution that they're having. And talk about the sexual revolution, which is also diabol um, diabolical, right? It's diabolical what they're doing with the sex revolution and the fact that people can change their sex. Even young children who have not yet gotten to adulthood. And some of them are being given the permission to do that on the Democratic Party without the permission of their parents. There are laws in Democratic states, in states run largely by the Democrats, in which parents are not informed when their children decide to make a sex change because the state gives them that sort of right not to inform their parents. Now, where would the society be going when we're doing that? Not to talk about the marijuana and the drugs or the legalization of these drugs. And we're not suggesting that the market could not have been liberalized. But it's the fact that you have this unfettered use of marijuana and other drugs, which are going to impact people, their minds, and it's going to give the authorities um, further power to imprison minority people. Because let's not deceive ourselves. Even though they are liberalizing these things, in some cases, when people begin to act up and they do not act within the perimeters of the law, then they're going to be imprisoned. So we're going to have now a mass incarceration of minorities, particularly black males. So the Democratic Party is anti-race. They're anti-black people. They're not pro-black people. They're not pro the elevation of black people. So when Trump says, you know, in 2016, was it 2015 when he was looking for the black vote? And he says that vote for me because you have nothing to lose. He was right. It's harsh. It's, it's some harsh words to say or to have pronounced, to have uttered, but he was right. Black people have nothing to lose voting for Trump. In fact, you have to take risks. That's what life is all about. If something is not working, 
then you have to try another option. It is embarrassing in 2024 that black people still were the large majority of people who voted for Kamala, right? All the other groups, including Muslims, Muslims who were historically pro-Democrats voted for Trump. Why? Because what they're seeing in the Gaza area is not pretty, right? And so they decided that they were not, they were going to share their votes between the third party, um, Jill, is it Jill Stein or Stein, whatever you call her, right? And, and Trump. And so they did. They were serious about that. They were serious that they would not have supported a party, even though historically that's the party that their parents and perhaps their grandparents supported. But they realized that they had to change because of the policies toward the Palestinians, the Democratic Party's policies. Now, we're not suggesting that the Republicans might not do that um, when Trump gets into power, but you have to wait and see. You cannot, when you're seeing that something is transparent, you need a change. And if the, if the Republicans get into power tomorrow, which they will eventually, on January 20th, and they do not stop the war, then the Muslims will say, we're, we're going to take our vote to another party. Maybe give it to a third party. That is how we have to play with our votes. We can't just give our votes to someone because historically our grandparents and our parents voted for this particular party. And this is what Caribbean and Black people and in general have done. And that is why you're not respected in America. You will never be respected in America if you do what you are doing because other ethnic groups have decided, including white people, white Americans who were once pro-Democrats, the working class in particular, realized that the party had lost its grip on reality and that they were just in the reality of the elites, which is not reality. People who are in the elite circles are not reality. Re you know, recently I was watching a documentary about the British royalty, the British royal family. And they were talking about Diana and Prince Charles. And, you know, I remember when Prince Charles was saying when he had his first or probably one of the first interviews in which he, you know, was being asked just before he got married or after they had been married, um, you know, if he you know, what the sort of love between both of them and he was talking about, depending on what you mean by love. Now, people, you know, took it that he didn't like that, which perhaps he didn't. But the, 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 the narrator of the documentary was saying that these people who live in the British royal family, who have grown up in that family, do not understand the real world. So even when they make humor, when they humor themselves and they think that people, normal people like you and I are going to laugh, it's not a joke to us because we understand the real world. And that is why Diana wanted her sons not to have just known that world. She wanted them, she was immersing them into the world, the real world, the world of real people. The Democrats behaved right throughout the campaign as if they were not in the real world. Because one, they decided that they would not have had a primary, yet they were talking about democracy. You are the party talking about democracy that, and you did not have a primary. Before, long into Joe Biden's presidency, the Democratic officials, the elites, the bigwigs such as the Obamas and the Schumers, they knew that, that of the impairment of, of, of um, Joe Biden's mental impairment. They were aware of that, and people brought it to the fore. People were saying that it's impossible for Joe Biden to go up for to seek re-election. Even in his first term, his first year, I mean, second year, people knew that he was even during the midterm elections, people, and he was walking and you know falling all the time. People knew that he was incompetent. He was not going to be able to go up for re-election. But the New York Times and the Washington Post and all these major news outlets, they decided that they were going to say, yes, that the, the reality was that he was competent. And those of us who were questioning his mental impairment and the fact that he was not mentally sharp to 
effectuate that sort of office, to work in that office, to, you know, to, 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 to undertake his job. They said that we were the ones who were delusional. The people who were speaking the truth were the ones who were delusional, according to these left-wing media outlets, according to the legacy media and the elites, the elite class, the political elites and the financial elites. It was when they saw now that he was not able in after June to have defect to, to have one uh Donald Trump in the previous debate, in the in the presidential debate held between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in, in June, that they decided that he could not. They had to come to a reckoning with the truth. The same thing is happening now. The only reason I thought that. Kamala Harris would have won is because I saw that there is a trajectory by the Democratic Party of rigging things. They rigged the pandemic because everything that they said about the pandemic was untrue. Untrue. And the revelation of the Twitter files revealed that all. And Matt Taibbi and another journalist who revealed the secret conversations among these elites and what they were doing and because these men revealed what they were doing, because these are their words, and they revealed them because that's the purpose of journalism. That is the purpose of investigative journalism. So Matt Tybee and um, Shalliner forgot his first name. They unveiled, they unmasked the conspiracies behind the pandemic or some of the conspiracies. Because remember now that when the Democratic Party won, and after Elon Musk had bought the had bought Twitter, which is now X, that he invited Matt Ta Taibbi and Shelliner to look at what the correspondences of the people who were controlling the pandemic. And after Matt Taibbi revealed these things, then the, the Justice Department came after him. He went to Congress in which he was treated like a you know, like a, you know, like garbage. The Democratic people there treated Matt Taibbi a very, a, a, a very decorated, a highly decorated American journalist and one who has a high degree of integrity, journalistic integrity, one of the very few in America as we speak. And they decided that they would have treated him. In fact, the tax people, they, they, um, the, 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 the American tax office went after him, right? They went after him, you know, leveling accusations against that his taxes are not, were not properly done when they were. But this is what the Democratic Party has gotten to. If it's not winning, it will rig things or it will threaten. And I thought that they would have at least rigged the election for Pamela, at least for the Electoral College votes. I knew she was going to lose the popular votes. It was just there that this is a Trumpian country. In fact, in fact, I woke up this morning thinking that the Republican Party, if Trump is this narcissist, as many people say that he is, and maybe he has narcissistic qualities, as many politicians and financial elites and oligarchs do. But if he is this quintessential narcissist, as they are implying, as they have intimated, he can, and only time will tell, he can actually at this moment name the party after him. He can divide the Republican Party and leave it up to the Dick Cheney's and the Liz Cheney's and say, this is the Trumpian party. Trumpian, whatever, whatever Trump whatever name he's going to give to the party. All right? Or the reform, or the Trump, Trump's reformed Republican Party, something of a sort. I'm sure he's he has competent people around him to give it a name. He can name it and to remove himself from the, from the Republican Party. Because it's not the Republican Party that won. It's Trump that won that election and his people, his base. His base brought him to that sort of um, notoriety, if you will. Absolutely. So let's not just think this is about Trump. 
This is about the people, the voice of the people. Now, will Trump and the leaders that he surrounds himself with, himself with, will they honor the will and the voices of the, the people, the masses that sent him, that gave him that mandate? We don't, because this is a mandate. This is a mandate. And you really wonder if this Trumpian victory has even eclipsed. And I would suggest that it, it has. It eclipsed what Barack Obama gained in 2008. He's now, just like the Clintons, I think that he has solid his image by endorsing Kamala. I think he did. Because Kamala was a very weak candidate. She was not the best candidate that should have represented women uh, or women or should represent should have represented um, black people or South Asian people. We have more competent black people, whether male or female. It's not about gender right now. It's about somebody coming up who would have been able to take over to articulate the sentiments of working and middle class people, of the masses of people who live in that country called the United States of America. It's not about being black and, you know, and having and wearing a nice pants suits that she was doing. You know, and you, you tend to have some of these professional, particular professional women who like to, you know, they're, they can just move papers along in an office. And by, because they can move some papers and shift papers along and they're wearing some nice fan suits and they have a nice house, they think that they, they're very important. And Kamala is one of them. She was not a competent candidate for that position. She would have lost to even the weakest of candidates because she wasn't able to articulate her policies. She wasn't. She didn't have a clue of what she was talking about, apart from abortion. And how can you run a campaign that is predominantly abortion? Right? While abortion might be important to some women in the United States, it's by far many women do not share that sort of, of perspective of just murdering their children irrespective of how the children, the child might have come about. Because we know that we're living in a painful world. And if we should just get things away because we want to ignore the harsh realities of life, there are many aspects of our life, including men's lives, that we would not want to be tethered to, but sometimes we just have to deal with it. And it's how you deal with it that ensures or that defines the quality of the man or the woman that you are. And there are women who have raised children that were, in, 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 you know, even though they were victims of rape and incest, and have raised these children to have become world-renowned, qualified men and women. You and I might not know about these things, but there are hundreds of stories out there, thousands of stories about women who have, you know, God bless their heart. They've gone through the most despicable. They passed through the most horrific experience. And at the end of the day, they understand that this is a human life. And if they can carry it, they will. Now, we're not talking about if the woman's body is in danger. And that's the decision between the mother and the child. Whether the mother thinks she wants to, she will kill herself. She will sacrifice herself for another child coming into the world. That's between she and her God, right? Her conscience, right? We know that we see, you know, uh, animals with their young ones and they will sacrifice their lives for the lives of their young ones. Now, I am not suggesting here that a woman should do that. I'm saying that's up to her. But if the brute animals can do that, I would imagine that, a rational, sensible woman, perhaps, would do that too. Because that is what love is all about. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. That's Christ laid down his life for us, who are sinners who deserve to have died. Right? So, those of us who are Christians, we can't be on the abortion side. We must, at all juncture, be ones, be advocates for life. Life 
that we did not make, that we do not have the capacity to make. We cannot breathe into anyone's nostril the breath of life. And in that case, we should not take it away unless, as I'm saying, under very extenuating conditions. But that's not what the Democratic Party was inferring. Right? It was just this, you know, and if you look at what these women, because they have lost, these women who were pro cavalry I see a number of them online and they're suggesting that in revenge, in their vindictiveness toward this Trump victory, they are going to refuse to give their men sex. They're not going to get married. Um, they're, they're not going to have any children for men thinking that they're actually you know, revenging men for having voted for Donald Trump. Now, this is what is in the minds of women. You can see this toxic level of feminism. And that is the aura that I perceived in the campaign of Kamala Harris. A toxic femininity, a toxic level of feminism. And women should have rights. I believe in female rights. And if females are doing the same job, that they should be paid equally. That they have a right if they're running for the presidency and they're competent to win the office. If they, you know, display the qualities and, you know, that people are looking for. Absolutely. And if Kamala had demonstrated the level of integrity that she was for traditional values, values that will bring society together instead of dividing them. Because this matter of the sexual revolution and abortion are very divisive issues that should be left up to the individual and not for government to be saying these things on their, on their platform. Government should be talking about the basics, right? The economy and things like immigration, foreign policy, wars, things that matter to all Americans, to the citizens of the world. I don't care really if someone decides, not actually I, I don't care, but it is not really my business if someone wants to change his or her sex. That is up to the individual. Now, if this is getting out of hand, the government have to intervene because this is a dangerous agenda. But to have this on your platform, that this is a primary platform policy is absurd, right? And it shows that you are delusional. And I think Canva for the most part was delusional. But the fact of the matter is that the Democratic Party understands now that it lost the election because it decided that it was for the elites, that it was going to, you know, align its policies with the policies of the elites, right? Look at what this um, this article that was written by Jacobin. Democrats aren't campaigning to win the working class, right? That's what this article is saying. Democrats are not campaigning to win the working class. Let me see if I can sh share this with article with you from the Jacobin, and that's also another left-wing newspaper. So I'm not reading from right-wing and, oh, he's right-wing. I'm not right-wing nor left-wing. I am about, you know, objective, viable um, policies and living in a practical world. I don't want to live in this, you know, world of illusion, in this elusive world that many people are living in and desire to live in. And people who have children, I don't know how you could be voting for Democratic Party on, the, that, on that basis in the fact that the Democratic Party supported genocide around the world, including what is happening in the Gaza era. How could you do that? But that is your uh, right to do that. But remember now, all rights with rights come responsibilities and consequences. So we have here that Democrats aren't campaigning to win the working class. And this is by Jared Abbott and Fred DeVore. A new study examines the democratic rhetorical, let me see if I can put it, rhetorical and campaigning failures that may help Republicans entrench their position as a new party of the American working class. 
President Joe Biden speaks during an, an EBU conference in Washington, D.C., April 19th. And uh, let us see what he's saying. Democrats are losing the working class. And if the trend continues, it will reshape American politics for generations. Simply, there's no sustainable path to victory in national elections without these voters. A more affluent Democratic base means less electoral support for progressive economic policies and losing the working class will accelerate the rise of far-right populism. While there is growing debate about whether and how Democrats can win back the working class, recent analyses we have conducted at the Center for Working Class Politics suggest that their best bet is to run economic populists from working class backgrounds. Take the case of Marie Glusenkamp Perez. The freshman working the Democratic representative prevailed in 2022 in Southwest, Washington's large working class um, third district, despite the fact that she was given just a 2% likelihood of victory rating by 538. So we're seeing here that the Democratic Party is undoubtedly the party of the elites. They're not the party of the common laborer, of labor, of unions. They have alienated themselves from that base. In fact, when you look at the campaign, Kamala Harris's campaign, who did she surround herself, herself with? She surrounded herself with um, the, the um, not only the financial elites, but also these entertainers, these celebrities. So you had people like the Beyonces and the, you know, the Katies and the um, Cardi B's. Right? She, these are the people with that you know that she was surrounded by, right? And she paid them millions of dollars. <laughs> she paid them millions of dollars to show up at her ballots. Now that could have been given to working class people. Why didn't she invite a teacher, a nurse, a lawyer, some you know, on the platform to say and to talk about the Democratic Party and their understanding of the Democratic Party and if they're surviving as people? Why didn't they invite the Muslims, the uh, Muslim Americans, to express what they are seeing, what their sentiments are with regard to the war in the Gaza area? She deliberately, and the DNC elites deliberately decided that that would not have happened. Why didn't they invite working class black males to express themselves and to say how they feel about her and what they expect from her? Notice that Kamala did not reach out to black males and she didn't reach out to them in any, you know, substantive way. But it was after the meeting with the Latinos in their conference that she realized that Black males and Black people, to some extent, were, going, were not going to vote for her. And she started now going after and telling what she's going to do to help Black males and all that phony nonsense. So Kamala Harris could not have been for Black people. right? She's not for Caribbean people, too. Because when you see what is happening in Haiti, and Haiti is what you call a Black country, what Americans call a black country, okay? And she's not helping Haiti in any way. In fact, the policies of the United States is devastating Haiti, hence the large migration to that country and around other countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. Because Kamala Harris's policies are toxic policies for black and brown people. And only brown people understand that. So-called black people have not yet understood that. And I don't think they will ever understand that because if Kamala should, you know, God forbid and something should happen <laughs> and Kamala comes back, she there's a resurgence of Kamala tomorrow. Black people would still vote for her. Right? Black people would in fact there are black people now blaming other black people for not have for, for having not shown up for Kamala. <laughs> you should sing freedom, 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 and freedom does not mean anything, right? It's all about dancing and whining and enjoying yourselves. Nothing in the brain to say that 
what Kamala policies, her policies did not align with working class and middle class values. And that her cultural wars were wars that were dividing and have been dividing the American people. Hmm? A government is there to protect people's rights, not to enforce countercultural revolutions and, you know, what we call values that are part of the subculture. A lot of what they are showing us and telling us now that our normal behaviors, normal cultural tendencies are what we would call, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, subcultural values. Right? People who are not enlightened. And that's the value. Those are the values that Kamala was embracing. Now, in terms of the Caribbean, we are in a situation um, where there is a lot of neoliberal policies and the IMF and all that stuff. I would encourage us, instead of trying to think that the Democratic Party is our friend, that we should find ways and means of negotiating with the Trump administration and move away from this Trump is racist and he's uh, a xenophobe and all of that nonsense. We need to speak to him. One of the things about Trump, and I'm not a Trump enthusiast, but you have to give the man his credit. He's an extraordinary politician. He has morphed into an extraordinary politician. He Here was a man who, whom the entire establishment came up against, and he won them. Remember now, two impeachment, right? All of these court charges of the, you know, he's a felon, he's a convicted felon of 34 charges leveled against him. And he came out the victor. January 6th, and he was this instigator of this large scale mob. Right? And he became the victor. Something should be, you should be waking up to something. Because at the end of the day, truth wins, you know. Truth might not win right now, but in the final analysis, truth wins. Even when the majority of people are saying that it's not true. And that you're a criminal. And we're not suggesting that Donald Trump might not, Donald Trump has a lot of flaws, just like you and I do have a lot of flaws. And he's a human being. We're sending humans to the office. These are not people that are Christ and who are gods. These are human beings with their human foibles and weaknesses, like you. So that's why the Bible encourages us to pray for them. Because if God were to reveal a lot of the things that we have on our minds and things that we do in secret, we would also be embarrassed. And perhaps we'd be in prison. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps would be in prison. So we have to be careful. Even some of the people who are called professionals and we're getting monies from drug people and some of the things that you do because you want money and you are transactional just like Donald Trump, right? Some of the men out there who rope women too and do these things that Donald Trump is accused of doing, paying them off, silencing them with sometimes money from the company that you're working for, but you hide it. And if God were to reveal it to one, you would be like, wow. <laughs> right? So let's not get on Donald Trump's, um, what should I say now, his personality traits and begin to think that we are morally, um, you know, we demonstrate this moral rectitude and we are morally superior to Donald Trump, because we're not. <laughs> Both of us, if the truth be told, are not morally uh, superior to Donald Trump. But let us talk about his extraordinary um, ness, his extraordinary disposition. The fact that he was able to, 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 to win against such a, a, a gigantic system that was against him, shows the matter of this man. Now, Donald Trump is a person, even though he talks a lot, and he does talk a lot, but he also listens. He's a good listener. And when he's in a negotiation, he sits and he listens to his opponent. And I think that 
maybe countries like Jamaica could engage him into a conversation about the austerity that we're facing with the IMF. Like, we don't know if he could do anything about it. Maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. But let us not now reject this man and behave as if he's the worst president since Sass Friend. There's an article written in the Jamaica Gleaner too about uh, Donald Trump's win. Um, and this was is written by Peter S. Street, and he says, as I have also pointed out, electorally, we here in Jamaica are faced with a similar moral dilemma. Judging by the response, it seems that many Jamaicans would have preferred was as the result in the U.S. elections. That's, they would have preferred to have Kamala. Let me repeat, a candidate being Black, a woman, or of Jamaican descent, provides no reason for anyone to vote for them because they're not in office to defend your interests, right? Voting for any of those reasons would be just as immoral as voting for someone because they are white and racist. And that's what I'm saying, that you are suggesting that because white working class people for the most part voted for Obama, not, not, not uh, for Donald Trump, that they're racist. But when you're going to vote for Obama because he's black, <laughs> you're racist too. Or you're voting for Kamala because she's a woman and she's black and she's South Asian, you are also racist. You have to look, you have to look carefully and deeply at what you're saying. Because the president is not sent, sent to office as Obama succinctly articulated, he's the president for all Americans. They are not defending the interest of many of us. They're defending the interest of the people who sent them there through their sponsors, their, 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 the donors. The, these are the primary interests and whatever sprinkling, whatever, you know, trickling that we might get then of the crumbs, that is, then so, so you know, that's good for us. But they're not sent to office to represent women or to represent black people or to re represent the white working class or to represent white people, right? Because these elites don't care. So the duty of citizens is to support the better candidate, the one that will best navigate the nation in the direction of the common good. Well, he's talking about the Catholic. Time will tell whether the worst fears about Donald Trump are realized, right? Now, look at what the, uh, Peter Espich went on to say. It seems to me from a distance that the big issue surrounding this US election was abortion and possibly homosexuality. Many women in the United States deeply resented Donald Trump for intentionally setting out in his first term to appoint justices to the US Supreme Court who would overturn the 1973 judgment Roe versus Wade which created abortion rights for pregnant women, for pregnant women. The fear of some is that in a second term, President Trump will appoint more pro-life and anti-LGBT Supreme Court judges who might ban abortions altogether and possibly reverse the 2015 uh, uh, Obergefell and versus Hodges uh, decision, which granted same-sex couples the legal right to marriage, right? Now, these are important points that he's raising here. And for the life of me, Black people have always been conservative, but yet we support liberal cultural values. That's also another contradiction. Why do we vote for people because they say nice things, they say things that we want to hear, but things that they do not do? when they're in office. The promise is that they do not fulfill upon gaining the office, upon ascending to the, to, to the office. They don't do it. They don't fulfill their promises. And that's why black people, Caribbean people, I can't say Latin Americans because Latin Americans are growing up. They're realizing that they have to vote for their best interest, within their interest, not what the politicians are saying, but that they have to see that the first priority is their economics. Now, there is, let me end here with this article written by um, another article from the Jacobin paper. 
And it says here, Requiem for the Obama Coalition, written by Vivek or Vivek Shiver. Now, Kamala Harris, okay, I think that is over for years, the Democrats have known that they are losing the white working class. They knew that. Their complacency has issued from the conviction that they can make up for it by gaining among the college educated while retaining a grip on the minority vote, which really means black and Latino voters. And of course, they thought that blacks and we have black people for the most part have been loyal. <laughs> Even when they're kicked and they're battered and they're spat upon, they don't care. Other groups, other ethnic groups, other demographics do care about how they're treated. Well, black people are, you know, just love to be slaves. This has been the social base of the weekly populist identitarianism of the identitarianism, which means that you are talking about black, white, and Latino, of the post-Obama era. Trickle down and anti-racism for the minorities and suburban college crowd, and a few crumbs to the white working class, just because to keep them tied to the millstone. What we see in this election is the demise of that strategy. The white working class exit from the party is now largely complete. Even more, Donald Trump appears to have pulled up just about even among Latinos and has made inroads with black men too. Right? So the Democratic Party is has is going around the field. It's now doing its final <laughs> death lap, right? Um, as it runs around the field. Whether or not they will take the working class vote seriously, only time will tell. I don't think they will. I don't think they will. I think that the Democratic Party is living in a world of delusion. And why they are not going to be reformed is because they think that these educated you know, people are the people who should know. They are the ones who do the polls. They are the ones who embrace science. So they should understand the pulse of the world, the pulse of the nation, which they don't. Because as I have often said on this channel, that for the most part, the educated class is bereft of an understanding. I'm not saying everybody, but for the most part, is bereft of an understanding of the world in which we live. The educators, because they are so tethered to theoretical framework, to graphs, to statistics, and what the polls say or the polls don't say. And talk about the pollsters and what they did, the horrific job that they have been doing since 2016. And they're talking about misinformation and disinformation when they are the greatest people who diffuse, they're the primary people, I should say, who diffuse disinformation and misinformation. Right? They are. So I think this election has unmasked, as it were, the underbelly of the Democratic Party, of the elite system of governance in general. And I think that historians, if Trump runs successfully a good presidency, I think he is going to be in history. He's going to be written in history as one of the greatest presidents that America has ever seen, perhaps the world has ever seen. How can that be? A man that is known to be a convicted, touted as being a convicted felon, is going to be recorded in history as one of the greatest, if I suggest, if he has a successful presidency and he sets out to do, he accomplishes what the task, the mandate that the people ask him here. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you like and you share and you subscribe. Remember now to like the videos so the videos can be shared with as many people on the platform. All the best. See you then. Ciao.